Today, we have Dr. Bruce Rind talking about the power of tangible love and transforming doctors into healers. The power of love is not something which is esoteric or, or airy-fairy. It's very real. It's very tangible. I had worked with uh, one of my mentors, uh, an osteopath, very well known, uh, Dr. Robert Fulford, who died at the age of 95. I used to watch him create what most people would call miracles, um, just before everybody, just demonstrating how he was doing things. And that was the most uh, profound and tangible demonstration of, you know, some people call it energy work, some people call it something else. And he would have no hesitation in saying it was all about love. And I will explain how and why wow. and what we can all do to empower ourselves and those around us to have that uh, type of experience. So we are all potentially healers if we choose the path of love. Yeah, if you could tell us maybe uh, briefly what your background has been and what you're currently doing, that would be fantastic. Let me tell you where I am right now for a minute. <clears throat> yes. Let's go back to uh, how it started and it'll take you through my journey and then you'll understand. When I graduated medical school, um, and I was uh, in 1976, so you could do the math. It's been a long time. And uh, uh, it's been 44 years right now so far. So um, when I finished all my studies and was getting into internship, um, I decided to go into family practice. Uh, I didn't last more than six months. I was asked to leave the program. And when I asked them, why uh, do you want me to leave the program? They said, well, you'll never make it. You'll be a disgrace to our, uh, our uh, practice. And, uh, you know, because you're never going to make a living. I said, why do you say that? And they said, because you're taking too much interest in each patient. You're asking them too many questions. You're spending too much time with them. You can't get into that level of detail. You got to get them in, give them their drug or their treatment and get them out and get the next one in. Otherwise, you will never make a living and you will be the only doctor that we ever had that has not been able to make a living and you'll be a disgrace to us and you'll embarrass us and we don't want the program affected. Right. The hospital asked me to start a pain clinic and what did I know? I mean, in those days, a pain clinic is you numb the nerve, you know, you get rid of the pain. And uh, I was pretty good at that. So I started their pain clinic, uh, did what they wanted. And I became even more disgusted because I noticed that I was taking away people's pains, but I was not making them well. They were not able to get back into their life. They were not really regaining their health again. And I got so disgusted that I decided to leave medicine. I told my wife at that time, I, um, I'm leaving medicine. And uh, no sooner did I decide to leave medicine that I um, injured my back. And suddenly I realized I might have to retire even faster than I planned. Uh, one of the nurses that I knew that liked me took pity on me and she wanted to help me. And she came to me and she said, I'd like to help you. And I said, nobody's been able to help me. How can you help me? And she said, well, I might be able to. I said, how? She said, this was a small town upstate New York. She said, there's a chiropractor just outside of town that I know. And I think he can help you. And I said to her, you know, I learned about those guys. They're quacks. I, I, I don't really think I want to go to a quack. And she's a very <laughs> wise woman. And she said to me, when you're desperate enough to go to a quack, let me know and I'll refer you to a good one. So I said to her. Oh, wow. I like that. I like that <laughs> so a lot. I said, you know what? I said, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm there actually. So, okay. She gave me the number. I go there and the guy puts his hands on me, just feels my, my spine and tells me to hop on this bed over there. There's a treatment table and I hop on. He turns me into a pretzel and goes crunch. I thought he broke my back. I, I thought I was paralyzed. I didn't know what happened. Right. And I was in shock. You know, but I got up, you know, he told me, get up, get, stand up. I got up. I'm standing straight, no pain. And in my mind and in my heart, I knew this pain, this problem was completely gone. I, I just felt it. Wow. And, the first, and, then, and then that was the first thought. The second thought in my mind was, wait a minute, which of us here is the quack? So I, I realized because I was giving people injections of $300 a shot at that time to alleviate some of their back pain and it wasn't going anywhere and I wasn't helping them. And this guy, $15 and 15 minutes later, I'm fine. 
And I thought to myself, who's the quack, you know? So I uh, decided, I need, while I still have six months on my contract, I'm going to start learning about this and see what I can do to help my patients. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, I just wanted to tell you, you know, this, I felt this was guided all the way through. When, when my back went out on me, I, you know, my first you know, reaction really was, God, why are you doing this to me? I just decided I'm going to leave something that doesn't help humanity. I'm going to look for other ways to help humanity. And you're kicking me when I'm down. And now you give me a back uh, injury. Right. And uh, what I didn't realize was that uh, that pain in my back was God's boot on my butt, right. pushing me through the door I didn't even know existed, but was hoping for. And I went through that door. Yeah. And there's an old saying, one of my favorite sayings, the caterpillar sees the end coming, God sees the butterfly. So I... Um, I took that course um, on osteopathic uh, techniques, came back, started working with it, and oh my gosh, people started getting well. I started helping people, and I realized there's a whole area of medicine that I didn't even know, ex not only did I not know existed, but I was told it was quackery. And of course, I can't, you couldn't work with these quacks without learning more heresy, and I started to learn about other heresy, such as, um, nutrition, uh, such as in, th in those days, acupuncture was considered heresy. It was, you know, what do a billion Chinese know? I mean, we, we got it. And I decided to learn acupuncture. And the funny thing was the guy, the teacher said something very interesting. He said, the Americans are laughing at the Chinese. This was like, what, 40 years ago? He said, the, the Americans are laughing at the Chinese because uh, we're saying, you know, those guys, they're so silly. They, they think you can cure a cold with a needle. And the Chinese are laughing at the Americans because they say those stupid Americans, they think you can't cure a cold. So, um, you know, the, um, um, I started to learn about the different worlds that I live in and how to interact with them and how to work with it. And I started accumulating skills and started to have a lot of fun in my work. And I decided not to leave medicine. I decided to uh, continue doing what I was doing, but kept on expanding in the directions that I was um, going. So traditional osteopathy, this is really fascinating for anybody who is, you know, a little bit uh, spiritual, um, just to give you the idea of the beginnings. And, uh, uh, it was started by a uh, doctor, by an MD, by the name of Andrew Taylor Still. And in those days, there was, um, medicine was extraordinarily primitive. He was a very brilliant doctor, and he, he lost his children to a disease that was, uh, he should have been able to treat. And him and his skills and his friends with their skills, nobody was able to help his children and they died. And he went into a deep depression and he went into the forest for a few weeks. And when he came out, he was a totally changed human being. And he started to see the world in a very different way. And he, he became also more intuitive. Um, he became extraordinarily intuitive actually. He developed some crazy heretical ideas that in those days were considered so heretical. He was run out of town by the doctors wherever he tried to set up shop. They once even burnt down his house. Um, he, he was chased out and he could not find peace until he found a little town in Kirksville, Missouri, which was underdeveloped. And he set up shop over there. What were his crazy ideas? He believed in, and now remember, we're talking about the 1800s, okay? He, this is after the Civil War, you know, um, okay. in, but maybe 1870, 1880. He believed in crazy things like the mind affects the body, the body affects, the body chemistry affects the mind. He believed in nutrition. He believed in exercise. He believed women should be doctors. He believed that all human beings, we are all spirits living in the body. We're, we're, having, we're physical beings having, uh, we're not physical beings having a, a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. Right. So he looked at everybody that way. You didn't have to tell him about women, about minorities, about this. You didn't have to tell him anything. He was already there. He was way ahead of where we are right now. And so because of his very different ideas, he was, he was ostracized by the uh, conventional uh, medical uh, system to the point where he finally said, the hell with this. He said, I'm not an MD. 
I'm throwing away my MD. I'm a new type of doctor. I'm an osteopathic doctor. Um, he became famous very well, even before, very quickly, before, even before he started the school. He, um, uh, he, was, he developed a reputation for healing to the point where people started coming from far away places and they set up tents. There were no hotels, motels. They set up tents and Kirksville, Missouri became known as the tent city. Because, really? Wow. Yes. And then eventually it, it uh, grew so much because of him, they ended up putting a railroad line or something. You know, it was like, he, I mean, he just changed everything on his own. But he, he got there only because he wanted to run away from all the other doctors that were criticizing him for the way he was functioning. And he also believed that, uh, he said that if medicine continues the way it's going, we're going to have a, a country full of drug addicts and, uh, and unnecessary surgeries. And uh, he said, what we need to do... And this is was back in the late 1800s. Yes. And he said, wow. uh, he said what, what, we, what a doctor needs to do is to learn how to work with their hands. And he developed a whole mechanism for working with your hands, which late, one, of his, uh, one of the people that came to see him was a fellow by the name of D.D. Palmer, who learned how to do some of the manipulation things, how to work with his hands, went back, set up his shop, and decided to call it chiropractic. Hmm. Um, later on, these techniques um, became uh, more widely known, but very diluted, very diluted version of it. In World War II, we developed uh, antibiotics. People started to survive injuries, but they had amputations, they had other injuries. And so we needed a way to rehabilitate them. And we borrowed from that, and we called it physical therapy. So the, um, um, the seeds that he sowed, in those, I mean, he was talking about uh, psychoanalysis before Freud was in diapers. He, he was so far ahead of his game that it was really amazing. And there's another cute story that I would, wanted to just share with you. There was this doctor, I forgot the guy's name, and he was a very well-known doctor and very respected in his own right. And he heard about Dr. Still and he decided to come and study with Dr. Still. And he said, um, uh, what... Um, um, he said, uh, uh, you know, he walks into the, to his house and he sees some guy, you know, lounging on, a, on the couch, relaxing. And he, and he said, uh, is this Dr. Still's house? And he said, yeah. He said, are you Dr. Still? He goes, yes, I am. And he's laying on the couch like that. You know? And this doctor only had one medical problem. He was deaf in one ear. But aside from that, he was in good shape and he was a brilliant okay. doctor. So he says to Dr. Still, Dr. Still, I heard that you can teach me a lot. And I came a long way to see you. And he said, but I'd like to ask you, what is it that you can teach me? And Dr. Still said, come closer and I'll tell you. And he said, okay, he comes a little closer. He said, no, come, I'll show you, come on. And he, says, he said, no, a little closer. So the guy gets real close to him and Dr. Still grabs his neck and he goes like that and does an, uh, an adjustment on him and gets the bone back in place, you know? And the guy's in shock. He's never seen or heard of anything like this. And he got up and he was in, he thought the guy was going to break his neck, you know? Right. Anyway, he gets up and he's, his neck is still in one piece. And he goes, what was that all about? And Dr. Still said to him, check your ear. And the guy goes, oh, my God, I can hear. He goes, that's what, what? I can he said, The guy said, I can hear. And Dr. Still said, that's what I can teach you. Wow. So that was the beginnings of osteopathy, just so you understand what osteopathy really is because people think it's just a bunch of bone cracking and it's it's a make-believe chiropractic and it's nothing like that it is a philosophy of medical practice now one of the earlier osteopaths that was uh trained by by dr steel by dr stills uh people you know his immediate students mm -hmm. was a fellow by the name of um robert fulford fulford started his career when most people finish it. He couldn't get into medical school, didn't have enough money to get in. And he saved his money until he was about 50 years old or whatever in his late forties, when he finally was able to get into school and he got into an osteopathic wow. medical school. And when he graduated, he later became the leading osteopathic physician in the world. This fellow, Dr. Fulford, uh, who had a very long career. He died, I said, as I said, at the age of 95. And he, and he worked with children and he taught up until the end. At the end of his life, he worked mostly with children. But um, 
he, um, he embodied what a healer would be because he worked through love. He worked in the presence of love. The way he worked was like, a, like nothing I've ever seen, and I will just, I'll do my best to describe it. Um, he, he was known for producing all kinds of miraculous effects. I once ran into a, uh, a woman at a course I took, uh, not a medical course, it was something else. And uh, uh, she found out I'd lost the apathy. She said, oh, can you do cranial on me? I said, why? She said, and she was in her 50s. She said, when I was about 10 years old, I had a doctor do a cranial on me and it cured me. I said, what happened? She said, I had severe learning disabilities. I couldn't read or write. I, I was in terrible shape. And my mom took me to this one osteopath in Ohio, a little town in Ohio. And, and he worked on me and he did a cranial an, uh, adjustment on me. And that was just it, just one treatment. And he said, fine, you can go, you're okay now. And she said, I never had any learning disabilities since then. I'm a, I'm a high executive oh. right now. She said, I, I, I'm very highly paid and, I, and my, you know, my talents are, are you know, sought after. And uh, she said, I figured he did such a good job I wonder if you could just do a little cranial on me now, you know? So I said to her, I need to know who this guy was because not too many people do this level of work. Right. And she said, nobody you'd know is a small town in Ohio. I said, try me. And she said, some guy nobody ever heard of. His name was Robert Fulford. And I said, yes, I know him. He was my teacher. <laughs> okay. So, so as far as Robert Fulford goes, uh, I, I want to talk to you about his skills first because I want you to know who he was. Then I will bring in how love played into it and how it's very tangible. So the, um, somebody uh, invited a patient. You know, we used to invite patients to these classes if anybody knew somebody with a big problem. And the, this mother had brought her daughter who was about 10 years old, nine or 10 years old, a very cute little beautiful faced blonde, blue eyes, um, who walked like the hunchback of Notre Dame. She was very, very crooked and her knees were bent and she had uh, cerebral palsy and her gait was very, very choppy and she was in very bad shape. And uh, uh, it was very tragic just to look at her, this pretty little girl in such a deformed body. And uh, uh, he uh, and the mother brought uh, brought her daughter as a... Uh, to be worked on by Dr. Fulford. And uh, uh, Dr. Fulford, uh, you know, asked, you know, the girl to come towards him and he talked to her for a minute and just became friendly, made a connection with her. And then he asked her if she wouldn't mind to just lay down on the treatment table. And he started talking. And what he said was, um, this young lady has a problem in the cranium. The uh, the temporal bone is is, you know, moved out of position and a little bit and it's locking up the rest of the uh, bones over here and he associated it with the pelvic bone he said that pelvic bone is um, is related here and he said that those two bones are um, are working with each other and he said the problem really has to be fixed at the pelvic first but you can't fix the pelvis until you fix what caused the torsion in the pelvis and that goes down the leg down to the ankle and he um, and he said I need to fix her and he's talking to us and he said I need to fix her ankle first because the um, this um, when she was born she was breached the foot was sticking out the doctor tried to pull her out grabbed her by the ankle and he created a, a, a very very strong strain at the ankle finally got her out and uh, it was a traumatic uh, delivery however um, uh, he said it all starts with the ankle and the mother stepped forward and said I've never seen this doctor before in my life never spoke to him he doesn't know anything about me I don't know anything about him except that I was invited to come here. But what he just described was the exact delivery that this young lady had, that my daughter wow. had. And, uh, he, um, and he said, first you have to, to work here. So he showed how to release the, the ankle, then the knee, then the hip. And then he said, before I go on to the, to the head, there's one more thing I need to do, and that is to take the shock out of her because she was shocked when she was born. She thought she was going to go back to where she came from. She didn't know if she was going to stay on this plane or not. And, he, and so he, um, he said the, 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 uh, she was traumatized, she was, um, and she needs to get the shock taken out. And he showed us how to do a shock release 
Wow. And, uh, and he did a shock release. Then he went to the head and he did some treatment in the head. And then the girl's just laying there all the time, just peacefully laying there. And he said to her, you're fine now. Get up and go back to your mom. And she gets up and walks like a normal girl. Everything is totally normal. And she, wow. you know, she goes over to her mom. And everybody was in shock. They were just looking at this girl that, that suddenly is a normal girl. And, uh, uh, and the mom, I mean, she was, her mom was like ready to faint, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and she, said to, she said to him, when shall I bring her in for another treatment? And he said, you don't need to. She's fine. She'll be okay. And that was it. That's who Robert Fulford was. I just wanted you to understand the level of function that he worked. I had a friend that, that came to visit me at that time. This is many years ago. Um, she uh, came to visit me and um, she was a very straightforward kind of person, you know, nothing to do with spirituality or any of that kind of hokey stuff, you know. And we were on break and she was waiting for me to go to lunch with her and she, and she looks, you know, looks at me and, and I, I said, she said, I want to ask you something. I said, what? She said, that old man over there at the other end of the room, who is he? And I said, why? And she said, I don't know, but there's something about him. She said, I've never seen this with anybody, but there's almost like an aura. It's just like he's radiating love. I mean, there's like love all around this man. And I said, yep, that's Dr. Fulford. So he was giving a talk to a class of osteopathic students. And he said, I've often been asked, to share my secret of what it is that I do that gets the results that I get. And why am I getting these kind of results? Uh, you know, what's going on? And he said, I'm gonna share my secret with you right now. He said, here's the secret. He said, the patient is laying on the, on the treatment table. You're at the head of the table. You're, you've got the head cradled in your hands. You're about a foot away from the patient. You're looking over the patient. You see the patient laying there and you blow some love. And there's always somebody in the back saying, how hard do you blow? Is there a technique to blowing? Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And, you know, so, you know, there's always somebody that's not going to get it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then there's those, there are those that totally connect, they get it, and they will start going in that direction and start having their own miracles in their own practices throughout their lives. Well, it's interesting, a couple of things that you had, had mentioned. Well, first of all, you know, as far as uh, doctors and the, and the regimen that they're required to keep these days, um, I mean, that's one of the very reasons my father retired earlier than he needed to or really wanted to because, well, you know, back in the day, he had his own practice. He could do it his own way. And then we came to the Baltimore area and he went to, you know, Johns Hopkins and some other more conventional places. And as the years went on, you were required to see more and more patients and spend less and less time with them. Um, and eventually it was just like, you know, this is not, it's, it's not the level of um, caring that used to occur when he had his own practice. And he's like, so I'm, you know, it's like all paperwork, it's all numbers, people are numbers and I'm out of here. <laughs> kind of like my father's father was also a doctor before him. And, um, you know, so we talked a little bit and he's like, you know, he really didn't have very many tools. He would go from house to house. He would make house calls and have his little bag. And there wasn't a whole lot back there. There wasn't a whole lot of medication. There was, a, you know, he'd just have, you know, a couple little apparatuses in his bag. But he said a large part of it was, call it what you will, placebo effect or intention or love, caring, nurturing. He said it was, that's what largely what medicine was about back in those days. And now that's not really what medicine is about these days. You're right. And by the way, and so there's two things I want to talk to you about that, you know, and then we're going to continue about the power of love in a minute, because I'm going to show you some more interesting things. But um, the, um, here's, here's something, here's a question about what's more powerful. What is more powerful? Being able to spend a half hour with a young lady and by the way, it took him a half hour to show that young girl with the cerebral palsy how to fix her. And the reason it took him a half hour is because he spent five minutes treating her and 25 minutes explaining to us what he was doing. Wow. Now, but let's give him a half hour. Let's say it took him a half hour, which it didn't. But let's say, let's say it took him a half hour. What is more powerful? Doing surgery 
pharmaceuticals, uh, hospitalizations, uh, physical therapy, I don't know, neural therapy, whatever you want, all the things in the world that can cost $100,000 or a half hour in somebody's hands that shows somebody th that works with love. And that love, it, you don't get to that level of skill because, okay, I'm going to love somebody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it now. No, that grows like a plant. You have to nurture your skill with love. You have to water that plant. You have to nurture it with love. And it grows and grows and grows. And Dr. Fulford's uh, seed simply grew into an oak tree. You know, it, it was like huge. But, you know, uh, a lot of us are lucky if we get a few blades of grass. The point is that um, you nurture it with love and it grows. And as you keep on investing with each patient, you keep growing with each patient. I'll give you an example with my knees. When I was in this class that one time, uh, I had uh, a year earlier, I had worked on my knees, you know, doing some carpentry or something at home. And I messed up my knees and I could barely, I couldn't bend, I couldn't squat. I was in very, very big pain, a lot of pain uh, with my knees. And I thought this would be lifelong and, and nothing will ever fix it. When I saw Fulford in the break, I said to him, um, can I ask you if you can help me for a second? He said, what is it? I said, I messed up my knees about a year ago and they're really very painful. Can you please look at it? And he looked at my knee and he, you know, he had me sit on a bleacher over there in the gym and he took, you know, my, my knee is bent like that, you know, and he took my ankle and he straightened my knee and then took my patella and wiggled it a certain way as he moved it this way, then went to the other knee, wiggled my patella as he moved my leg up and down like this a little bit. And he said to me, your knees are fine. You could get off now. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I thought, what do you mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, and so I got off and I squatted, I stood, I knelt, I stood, and I couldn't believe it. There was no pain. And I said, Dr. Fulford, you just cured my, my pain. I said, that's amazing. I said, but the technique you used, I've never seen this technique before. What, what kind of technique is it? And he said, it doesn't have a name. I said, well, where did you learn it? How did you? He said, I just developed it just now for you. So that's the level that he was functioning at. And so, um, it, so the, the work that he did, is, is it less about the, like, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to put it, the operation of what he's doing and more about the caring and intention about how he's doing it? 99% is intention and expectation. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute, because when you do energy work, intention is nothing more than a wish. Intention plus expectation gets you a result. But in order to get to that level, you first need the groundwork of understanding how the human body works. And then you can, you can build on that. But understanding how the human body works is just the basic stuff that you, the, the tools that you have to work with. But the, the intention, the love that comes with it, that is what implements those tools. That's what makes them work. You can't, a box of tools is just a box of tools. You've got to mobilize those tools. And that's what he was doing. Wow. So, so uh, um, the, um, the power of intention, let me, let me give you an example of how it goes on. There was a time when I had um, a doctor that I knew, he has since died, his name was Dr. Rao. And he was a head of a department uh, of uh, community medicine at uh, Howard University. And he invited me to teach because his daughter had a very profound illness. And uh, he, um, she, she, uh, she was hit by a car and they put the leg back together a little bit, but it was missing almost an inch. And um, she, she couldn't walk very well at all. She, her hip was damaged. Uh, so he, he came to me as a patient at that time. He brought his daughter and I gave her prolotherapy to reconstruct the, and help repair the ligaments in her pelvis. And very quickly, she developed good mobility of her leg and her pelvis without pain. However, leg was still short. So I did an osteopathic technique to, raise, to grow the leg. Now you might say, how do you regrow a leg, right? She was 18 already. Okay, well, you could regrow it for many years to come, you know, another 10 years at least in her case. Because uh, with women, I found up until 30, you could actually influence that. And with men, uh, a little past 30. So um, 
what I, what, there's an old osteopathic technique of putting pressure on the leg and there was an osteopath, this is the 1900s, you know, um, um, that he used to have kids bounce on their leg in order to stimulate the uh, epiphysis and the growth. And what I realized was I found a way to, um, to adjust the, uh, osteopathically adjust the uh, leg length by putting a lift in the shoe and functionally testing, you know, uh, like range of motion of the arms uh, to see, you know, if, if the leg is short, the arms lock up. But if you're just perfectly balanced, they become much uh, more even and symmetrical. And so I would use the functional assessment to see how much lift you needed. And that young girl needed about that much inside her shoe or outside her shoe. And um, her mother was a nurse and I taught her mother how to check like this. And I said, we're going to make the leg grow. And she looked at me like I'm crazy. And I said, we're going to make the leg grow and I'm going to show you how to do it because you're going to do it for her. And she said, how? And I said, check her for how much lift she needs. And if she's perfectly balanced, the short leg is going to start to grow little by little. And you will have to remove a little bit of that lift as the leg grows to keep them balanced. And I showed her how to, how to check and how to check the balance. And I said, what you're going to do is you're going to create a lift out of many pages, you know, maybe like 200 pages or something. Um, and um, as the, um, as the uh, leg grows, you remove a page or two or three at a time. And, and you're going to check her almost every day. And she did. And at the end of about a year, a year and a half, she required no lift, both legs wow. were the same height. Her father thought that I had created a miracle. This is just the magic of osteopathy, which is, by the way, osteopathy cannot function in the absence of love. Otherwise, you're just a technician. And I'll explain a little more in a few minutes. Uh, in a tangible way, we're not talking about esoterics. So, um, so her father was so impressed with, with, it, with what happened that he asked me if I wouldn't mind lecturing to his class. And I said, what kind of class? And he said, well, it's a, a community medicine. He said, it's the class everybody skips. But, uh, uh, but he said, you know, it's a forum and I would like you to influence as many of the medical students yeah. as you can because uh, I would like them to, to know the kind of medicine that you're doing. Yeah. So I said, um, okay, and I came. And the first time, I, it, it was about 90 students in a class or something, and a classroom holds only 30, so they divided it. So I, I had to come three weeks in a row, and uh, each week was 30, supposed to be 30 kids. And I came in, and there was about 12 or 15 kids, you know, sprinkled around the classroom with empty seats all over. And I spoke to them, and I gave them a very brief history of what I just gave you, and I, and I showed them the power of intention and expectation. Some people call it energy work. I really don't care what you call it. You know, to me, it's just advanced osteopathy. But um, um, you cannot, by the way, communicate to have that level of communication, uh, in, whether it's intuitive, whether it's te telepathic, whatever you want to call it. You can't have that level of, of communication. It does not exist if you are not in the presence of love. Because let's say I was with you and my thoughts were, okay, you know, how much money can I earn from this guy? Your subconscious, regardless of what my words are and my expressions and how many diplomas I have on my wall, your subconscious is saying, be on guard. Don't, don't let this guy into your field. Don't let this guy into your consciousness or subconsciousness. He is bad news. Stay away from him. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm smiling. I'm a nice guy. You know? No, you know, your subconscious already put the barricades up and it's not going to let me in. If I'm there and the only thought in my mind is, I'm in the presence of love. What can I do to serve this human being? What can I do to promote his well-being, her well-being? What can, I, what can I do to uplift them and promote them and help them on their journey, to blow wind into their sails on their journey and be an, and be an instrument of love, an instrument of healing, an instrument of support? If I'm there with that presence, your subconscious goes, whoa, come in, you know? And suddenly there's a communication that could not exist in the, in the atmosphere of mistrust. So uh, no matter how my facial expression looks, your subconscious already reads it. We know where we are. So, so I showed them a few things. And um, 
the first, the first thing I showed them was, you know, this is an osteopathic techniques that I learned, you know, with how to feel, you know, first you feel by touching, then you could actually sense it at a distance. Don't ask me how you do it, but you just do it. So, um, uh, I was talking to him about that. So somebody, um, so, you know, somebody said, can you demonstrate here? So I said, do I have a volunteer? So one girl raised her hand. So she got up and she, um, and, and she said, what can you tell me? And don't ask me why, but I just, I felt drawn to her tooth right here. And I said, you have a problem with your tooth. And I pointed exactly to where that was. And I said, that problem in your tooth is creating a strain of it here, probably locking you up and your shoulder is probably locked up because of it. Uh, and she said, I am having some shoulder problems. And you are right. She said, um, it came on after I just had a tooth extraction. And I said, well, the extraction was very traumatic to you and the dentist didn't take good care to make sure that the, the soft tissues were cared for. So I said, let's examine you. And she came up front and I checked her arms and this shoulder was all over the place. This arm was a little locked in all directions. And I, all I did was just took the tension, a myofascial release, but it's very gentle. If you didn't know what I was doing, you'd think it's witchcraft but it's just a myofascial release. They teach courses on this. Anyway, I did a myofascial release over here. Then I went, did a myofascial release over here. And I said to her, let's check your shoulder again. And we went and she had full range of motion. Wow. The kids were stunned. The kids were like, oh my God, you know? And, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. <laughs> As anybody should be, yeah. Then I, then I, I said to them, now I'm going to, my purpose is not to show you what I can do. My purpose is to show you what you can do because each of you can do everything that I've just done. It's just a matter of nurturing your skills. And I showed them how to, with intention and expectation, and here's the key, intention by itself does nothing, it's a wishful thinking. Intention plus expectation is going to uh, uh, generate a result. If you expect a result, if you expect there's no result, that's what you get, you get no result because that's your expectation. So, um, so what I did was I, I asked for a couple of volunteers and I showed them how to project their intention on somebody. First, how to measure range of motion. And we found some people that had very locked up range of motion. And I said, you know, I, I took one student at a time. I said, okay, I want you to focus. You know, first, check the shoulder. Yep, it's locked. Focus, and I want you to have the expectation. I said, humor me. This is your first time, so just humor me. Have the real expectation that this is really going to uh, uh, shift something. And the kid did it. And I said, check his shoulder. And suddenly oh. went all the way around. And he was like, oh my God, what did I just do? And I said, pick another volunteer. And we checked shoulder. And, uh, and I said, by the way, it's not him. It's every one of you. I'm just picking on him just because I, can, I only have so much you know, so little time. And I said, um, check him again. And he checked and the guy was limited. And I said, I'm going to walk out of the room because I don't want to have any influence on this at all. And I walked out and I said, I'm going to come back in about 30 seconds. Just focus, have the expectation, the intention of relaxation, expectation of relaxation. And I said, and remember, you cannot do this if love isn't present. You need to be in the presence of love. If you don't get it, you know, don't even bother. Don't try. You'll embarrass me. So I said, just do it. And um, uh, in the presence of love, with focus, with intention, with expectation, I was out of the room. I came back. I said, let's check. Total range of motion. And I said to the students, I want you to understand how this affects every one of you. I said, if you want to learn these techniques, there are courses, there are ways you could do it. You could start by learning basic osteopathy. However, I said, what you are going to be doing, every one of you, is you're going to be writing scripts. You're going to be writing prescriptions. The energy you put into the prescription is reflective of your energy, your intention, and your expectation. When, you, when, you're, when your intention expectation is, I want to get this guy out of here so I can get the next guy in because I got to keep up with my billing, when that patient has a complication, you want to know why they had a complication? Look in the mirror. If you're going to have the right expectation, you will have the right intention. You will have the right expectation. 
even if it's a prescription, whatever it is, it is likely, you're more likely to give the right thing, to put the right thing down instead of the wrong thing down because of your expectation and tension at the moment. That prescription will, will have more positive energy. One of the best words of advice that, that I was ever given in medicine was uh, my older brother's friend had graduated from a medical school in France and he was uh, visiting New York. And I was sitting with him. I was still in uh, medical school and I was going through pharmacology at the time. And I said to him, his name was Mickey. And I said, Mickey, I, I really have a dilemma. I have a problem. Uh, I'm learning all these things. This, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm embryonic. I'm in a medical school. I'm not even born yet as, as, as a physician. And um, I said, I'm having an issue. I don't know what, um, what to do uh, because there's so many medications and so many procedures and so many things I can do when somebody's sick. How will I know I'm doing the right thing? Best advice I ever got, which carried me through my entire career until today and beyond. Um, he said, when you're with a patient, make believe you're with your mother or your daughter mm -hmm. or your sister, your brother, your best friend. What you would do for them is what you should do for this patient. And if you wouldn't do something to your mother or your sister or your daughter, don't do it to that patient. Wow. So he said, treat everyone like they're your best friend, your immediate family, someone you care for a lot, like your baby, your, your mom, or anybody that you really love a lot and you would do anything for. Treat them like that. And he said, you know what? You'll still make mistakes, but as time goes by, you'll make fewer mistakes and you will sleep better at night. And you'll have no friends. And you know what? <laughs> he was right. Because when I, when I, when I and, and I found out, you know, when I went through my medical career, I, everybody thought, oh, this guy's some kind of a do-gooder, he's a weirdo, you know? And, you know, so, you know, I was always uh, looked at as a little different because I always carried that attitude. And if my friends or if any of my colleagues would say something, you know, uncomplimentary about somebody, I, I would look at them and, you know, I would, I would actually try to bring them around and say, you know, this could be your father, your, your, your brother, your daughter. And right. they, would, they would look at me like, okay, this guy's a total weirdo. So um, what, I, what I used to tell the, the medical students after I would show them this and I would show them the power of their intention that only works in the presence of love. And I mean that very tangibly, very real, in a very real sense. Um, you make fewer mistakes if it comes from a place of love. Um, fewer Freudian slips and, and psychological errors because you are already in that place where this is your guiding force. But I, I, would also, I always told them that story. So treat everybody as if they are your loved one. And I said, you'll... You'll, have, you'll make fewer mistakes as you, get old, uh, as you go on with your career. You'll get better and better. You'll make more of the right decisions. You'll sleep well at night, and you won't have any friends in your professional circles. And that's true. I have, I have very, very few friends, actually. I have very few friends right now in, professionally, but every one of them I treasure because they all feel the same way I do. Right. Anyway. So, how, yeah, so the general message that people – get these days um, when it comes down to health or, or, or medicine is very different than um, some of the messages you've expressed today. I mean, what would you tell someone who was, I don't know, exploring the possibility or someone that just wanted to feel better, get better, change their state? What, what road, what path would you put them on? What would you tell them? Well, there's, the question is, am I talking to a, pr a prospective patient, somebody who wants, who's looking for medical help, or am I looking, talking to a prospective doctor, somebody who wants to go into the medical field? And I'll tell you what I tell both. Um, the patients, I, and I say this to my own patients, I have, a, um, I have a sign on my wall that's behind me, so the patient's looking at me, always looking at the sign, and the sign says, Three, uh, three principles of, um, uh, of doctor-patient relationship. Number one, your best physician is you. Number two, 
the medical professional is your consultant. And number three, if the first two are forgotten, it's you that's in trouble. So I always tell them that they need to be their own guide. They need to look inside because their spirit guide, their, their guidance is coming from inside. And it's their subconscious that's there to protect them. And when they override that by saying, no, this guy has a lot of degrees. I'll just trust what he says. No, if you have a, rep, a good rapport with someone, it's because their intentions are good. You're, you're sensing that. If you resonate with somebody, that's somebody you should be working with. If you don't resonate, don't. The, um, for the uh, prospective physician, um, there's, and, and I believe there are several levels uh, of it. Uh, there is, you have the medical student, then you have the doctor. The doctor is just somebody that has the basic knowledge. They, they got their degree. Okay, they, they're, able, they're allowed to walk in through the door. When they start applying physiology, when they start applying what they, uh, what they learned in school, now you have a physician. When they function as a physician in the presence of love, they will start to see things they never dreamed about as a physician. And they, things that they say, I can't even explain why this happened, but I'm very grateful that you're doing well now. They, they start to see these things happen, but that's because they're working in the presence of love. And that's when you've graduated to, to, in, to functioning as a healer. So there are different levels, doctor, physician, and you know, yeah, finally healer. And we all need to strive to be healers and we all can be healers in our own way. You are because you are sharing messages of love to, with, with, with a, a large number of people. That is your way of bringing healing to the world and to, to those around you. So we are all potentially healers if we choose the path of love.